Hi, I'm Marcy Kobayashi, and I'm back again with another excerpt from Finding Yo-Yo. If you've been following along, then you know that last time we had finally brought my in-laws to Tokyo to live with us, and so I'm going to pick up um, from there. Truth be told, we arrived back in Tokyo before confirming that there was a bed available for Okasan at the hospital. She couldn't walk, and we didn't have a wheelchair. Constructing a chair with their arms, Akira and his brother carried Okasan from the car to the elevator and into our condo. The first two days, Okasan slept in our spare room just off the entryway. Eventually, that tiny room became Otosan's domain, but for the first two nights, he camped out in our living room. He never complained and seemed to enjoy the warmth emanating from the heated floors and, of course, the big TV. I was nervous about what we were going to do with Okasan. The social worker at the hospital I visited was supposed to call as soon as a bed was available with the understanding that we would then arrange for Okasan's move. She didn't know that we were going to bring Okasan regardless. It was a risk, but there are many hospitals in Hachioji, and we knew we could call for an ambulance if Okasan started to dip. Fortunately, discovering that we had gone ahead with the move, the social worker mobilized and arranged an appointment for us to meet with a doctor that first week. As expected, after scanning the letter of introduction from the hospital in Hiroshima, the new doctor wanted to run his own tests to find out why Okasan was so weak and admitted her immediately. Evidently, they did have a, but a bed available. With Okasan settled in at the hospital, we moved Otosan out of the living room and into his new room. That was easy because all we brought from Hiroshima was a few change of clothes. He thought he would only be staying until the end of March, after all. Though I was grateful we were living in our own home instead of Hiroshima, everything about our situation was new. I couldn't believe how much our world had changed. Checking on Okasan at the hospital and helping Otosan get adjusted to his new surroundings seemed to take up all of my time. I didn't have any energy to focus on work. Okasan was doing okay, but she didn't know anyone except Akira, Otosan, and me. Akira's brother lived about an hour away and tried to visit her on the weekends. I didn't want Okasan to feel all alone in the hospital and made it a point to visit her every day, if only for a few minutes. If not, what was the point of us bringing her to Tokyo? Sometimes Akira would come with me when he wasn't at the university. Sometimes Otosan did too. Mostly, I went to the hospital by myself, leaving Otosan at home watching TV. It seemed better that way. It was good exercise for us both, but once there, he got bored quickly, and I worried that Okasan would see her husband's impatience. Otosan wasn't interested in talking with Okasan and sat on a stool at the foot of her bed, staring out into the hall, checking his watch every few minutes. Those early days in the hospital were tough. Okasan wasn't getting worse, and she wasn't getting better. She knew me and was clearly happy to see me. However, she wasn't talkative, nor did she want to watch TV. Sitting there together, I struggled at first to figure out how to pass the time together. She was awake and alert, so it didn't feel right to read a book or check email on my phone. I struggled to find things to say. Eventually, I found a rhythm that worked for us. Upon arriving, I would brush her hair, remove any that had fallen on her pillow, and tidy her side table. As I brushed and cleaned, I would go over everything that had transpired in our family from the time I left the hospital the day before until arriving back at the hospital again. I shared in detail how I walked home, what I saw on the walk, what I brought, what I bought at the store to make for dinner, and what I ended up cooking instead. I shared whether or not I did laundry and how long it took me to hang up the clothes. I shared about what TV shows we watched and what time we all went to bed. I shared what time I got up in the morning and how Otosan got up shortly after. I shared about the miso soup I made for breakfast and what kind of salad I made to go with the rice and eggs. I shared about my walk to the hospital and what flowers were blooming. I shared pictures of the flowers and recordings of the birds chirping on the river bank. Every day, I shared the same thing over and over with slight variations as our menu changed and new flowers bloomed. Afternoons at the hospital with Okasan became easier and easier. 
I brought a big tub of colored pencils, and together we colored. When she didn't have the energy to hold the pencils herself, I made her choose the colors. Together we colored many mandalas and taped them up on her wall. Slowly, the pale pink walls in her corner of the four-bedroom filled with our colorful energy. We also played cards. I taught Okasan how to play Go Fish, and one day we played together with Otosan. That only lasted a few times because Okasan was good. She didn't talk much, but it was clear she knew what she was doing. She kept winning, and that frustrated Otosan. He liked being number one, and it was as if he couldn't reconcile how this invalid and a woman at that could beat him. One day, after Okasan won another round, Otosan said he was sick of the game and didn't want to play. Okasan and I smirked at each other, and I put the cards away. Otosan slept in the slept in the chair while we colored another mandala. Being at the hospital, I knew what I was there to do. Spending time being with Okasan was my job. It was a relief in a way, and I enjoyed it. Once I got back home, I had to switch back and forth between doing household chores, household chores, and working on my business. I couldn't relax into either one because I always felt pulled by the other. On my walks to and from the hospital, I had time to let my mind water, oh, my mind wander. For a few minutes, I was free from all the concerns of our new circumstances. Those walks to and from the hospital probably saved me. One day, as I crossed the bridge about halfway to the hospital, the absurdity of our situation hit me. How was it that a young forty-something white girl from the U.S. had become the key point of contact for the care of these two elderly Japanese people? What were the odds? Who would believe it? Both their boys were alive and well, and there were other relatives equally as alive and well that could advocate for them. Yet here I was. How in all the universe had this responsibility come to me? And then I felt awe. I felt humbled and honored. Whoa, this was real. In the larger scheme of things, for reasons I did not know or remember, we had agreed to do this, and remarkably, the universe had arranged it to be possible. However unlikely, here I was, and here they were. I felt my heart squeeze up against my rib cage as if it would expand out of my chest. My eyes filled with tears, and I whispered, "Thank you. I accept." As I continued walking, I felt grateful that Okasan and Otosan trusted me. I marvelled at all the people at the hospital who seemed to trust me too. It blew my mind. Would people back home in the U.S. be as trusting? Would a young woman, clearly not related but claiming to be responsible, be treated with as much respect? Maybe so, but I wasn't sure. What I did know for sure is that by claiming responsibility, showing up regularly. And asking questions, I always got the help I needed to keep going. Just like how in every good story a guide appears right when you need them, I had people show up to help me. The social worker at Sanno Hospital was one of those guides. I feel indebted to her. Our story would be so different if it were not for her and the institutions she later introduced to us. Okay. That's all we have for today. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about Otosan and some of the things that we did with him in the first month while he was here, um, and how we got to know more about him and his situation. So, thanks for tuning in. I'll be back again next week with the next excerpt.